we're going to have a look at uh, UK DTS machines, uh, how we're using DTS. Quick look at some suggested settings. Uh, thanks for that. Um, resistance to lateral displacement. Um, and we'll have a look at some results we're getting with track quality and the longevity and questions at the end. So, so first of all, DTS, it's not a new phenomenon. It's been around since 1975. Um, there's over 900 machines in 45 different countries. Not extensively used in the UK. It was probably used more in the 80s and 90s than what it is now. I'm hoping to try and change that. It's been mainly limited to high output um, operations like ballast cleaning and manuals. Um, it's definitely mis misunderstood and there's a lack of knowledge. And for that reason, there's a big apprehension about DTS. And um, this story is going around that DTS has bought buildings and bridges, that, you know, stuff like that. Absolute nonsense. Like, it, it, there's nothing on the internet and there's been no, no history of anything like that. But we'll have a look at that a bit later. So what happens, track settlement? So when we tamp, even though we squeeze the ballast with the tines underneath the sleepers, it's still not as compact. Um, it's nowhere near as compact what it was pre-tamping. So we leave the, uh, and it's the same with ballast renewal. Um, when we're renewing ballast, there are large elements then of the, of the new ballast that aren't properly compacted. The ballast becomes, it's loose, it's got more gaps in it. Um, the individual stones just aren't touching each other properly, so there's less friction to hold, um, to hold the ballast and the components around it in place. It's in an inhomogeneous state. It's less, uh, less resistant to lateral displacement and less resistant to lateral longitudinal and dynamic forces. Therefore, there's a higher risk to track deforming or track buckling. And for that reason, we have to have lower handback speeds and we put on CRTs on maintenance, well, on tamping sites when the weather gets warmer. Um, also, the initial settlement takes place. So after we tamp or we, we have renewals, the main initial settlement takes place in the first 0.5 to 2 million tonnes of traffic. Obviously, it varies on different routes. Um, and the settlement's very irregular because we've got varying bogies, axle weight, speeds, camp deficiency age, rail leg conditions, ballast grade, ballast quality. So obviously we're getting a lot of different and irregular settlement um, caused dynamically in a, in a vertical direction. So this is, for that reason, it's very uneven. Um, and it reduces the longevity of the track quality. So if we come along, for instance, and tamp, we may look great after the machine, but because of the way it's set up with different vehicles and what I've mentioned, um, it, it, it's, it's, we do lose a lot of longevity, particularly on older track that's not supported well. And again, what we have is the angular ends of the ballast touching other end, other, other, other stones with big spaces in between. So. What happens is when we get this dynamic forcing of the trains, it breaks a lot of ballast as it settles. Um, a lot of people, we, we do damage, uh, damage ballast tamping, but the majority of uh, damage to ballast has actually come during settlement, which not a lot of people know that. So not only do we, it settles unevenly, we damage, we re so we're reducing the ballast grade. Um, and for that reason, because we're reducing this ballast grade, there is a slightly higher rate of settlement um, than what there should be. So as you can see there, um, see it's the track settling, so we tamp it, there's big gaps between the stones, um, and then there is this uneven, increased uneven settlement um, because of a bit of breakage and, um, and, and the factors that I've mentioned. Um, and this is just a settlement curve. It pops up a couple of times during this presentation, um, and it's, it's saying it's just a correlation between the settlement that we could generally expect on in normal track conditions on the lift applied. Yeah, quite a simple occasion there, 4.2 times the logarithm of the lift in millimetres minus four. Um, now, when we use DTS, it's an artificial settlement uh, induced by vibration. So rather than vertical dynamic, it's horizontal vibration. So um, it, you can use it to consolidate lifts on maintenance, follow-up tamps, quality tamps on renewals, or you can use it on higher settings and it consolidates large elements of the ballast bed after renewal. Or if it's deployed in layers, you can um, consolidate properly bed the entire ballast bed. So you've got this much even controlled homeogeneous settlement. 
as you can see there, the ballast will be a lot tighter packed together. There won't be as damaged, so it won't settle as more. So you've already basically got your settlement out the way after DTS. So you haven't, you haven't got to put this uneven dynamic forces. So then your track settles less after your interval and it settles more even. So, and we'll see, I'll show you some results on longevity later on, which were really surprised me as well. Um, and this is just to show you, yeah, your, your tamper will look after your packing points, as you can see around me, sleepers or bearers or timbers, whereas DTS will, will do the entire bed. And that's the same from a profile view. So you've got um, the tamping look, yeah, who looks after the pyramids directly underneath the sleepers, where DTS again can do the whole bed. Now, for this, the impact forces are directly transferred from the ballast from the area. So basically, because everything's all settled properly, we've now got bearers and sleepers, which are shaped to distribute in the forces onto the ballast and the track bed underneath a lot more even. So we have, you know, we haven't got uneven areas which which, um, which are stress rise and therefore more dynamic forces will hit them, which promotes more uneven settlement. It puts higher pressures onto the track bed system um, and stuff like that. Um, so it's a homogeneous special consolidation of the entire ballast bed. That's the message I'm trying to get across. Um, it increased stiffness of ballast layers and formation. Um, and again, it evenly distributes the force, not only into the track components, but even to the ground and the embankments surrounding. Um, significantly increases lateral stability by around 50% after tamping. We'll have a look at that later on. And obviously because of that, you've got everything settled. It's much stronger and tighter, so there's a reduced risk to track buckle. Uh, and misalignments. Um, also, um, our CRTs are five degrees higher, or just network rail standards if we DTS. Um, we get this reduction in damage to ballast, which is a massive, massive gain, massive increase in longevity of track quality, reduced maintenance intervals, so we're saving money on, um, on maintenance shift, tamping shifts or whatever. Lower exposure to staff, because we won't have as many faults after we're finding when we DTS track. At higher handbag speeds after renewals save a lot of money um, and intelligent uh, or variable type of DCS is, is incredibly flexible which we'll have a look at in a minute and you also it can give us good control over track positions because we, we, we're getting the settlement out of the way the vast majority of the settlement very quickly what you find is sometimes on renewal sites they will do a, um, a quality tamp or a follow-up tamp and they'll do it through a structure or platform and it's all great on the night when we come back to handbag Few weeks later of course the track settled and you know people wonder why we haven't got our as built so a lot of people really need to get the concept around settlement after we after we do our work um, and and this is a graph just so showing the intervals which you probably expect from standard tamping as opposed which is the yellow line so you would have more frequent intervals and if you have dts you could expect a slower rate of deterioration because the track is already settled and it's tight uh, now we're looking at the principal. That's an actual PTS um, system on the machine. I'll show you where it's located in a minute. And I'll go through all the different components, so I'm not expecting you to pick it up from that photograph. Um, and basically, PTS is quite simple. It's a mass attached to a cardan shaft. And the mass rotates at a set frequency, and this rotating, so it's an offset mass rotating around the shaft, which creates a vibration. Um, the set frequency dictates the circular frequency because um, obviously we're, 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 vibra uh, we're rotating. And this causes, yeah, like I said, the hover horizontal vibration, which is what we call the impact force. And it literally rubs the sleepers into the ballast. That, that's what it's doing. And at the same time, we simultaneously uh, apply a load with four cylinders. And the factors affected it are the ones I've just mentioned. It's frequency, the dynamic impact force or the vibration, how much static load we put on, and to a much lesser extent, the working speed of the machine. Frequency, uh, the typical range is 28 to 35 hertz. We generally use 30 to 35. Uh, this range gives optimum ballast compaction and interlocking. Um, and what you do, if you, you're thinking about which one to do out the 30 or 35, you can just pick any one and, and literally put your hand on the frame of the machine and it's, and it's one which least resonates with the machine, except for if the machine is reacting less, then more forces are going into the track. That's simple. So sometimes you can see us like just putting our hand on. It's quite hard to actually feel on, on a lot of them. I generally use around, what, 31, 32 hertz is, is generally what I use. Um, 
below this, you've got to watch uh, going below 30 hertz, particularly when you get onto uh, structures, which I'll talk about more. They resonate around 23 to 25 hertz, so you really want to avoid them frequencies, A, because free, uh, structures will react to it, but B, you're not getting your optimum consolidation either. Um, frequencies above 38 will tend to liquefy the ballast, so it's sort of like vibrating it the other way. It's, it's a bit like if you put some grains of sand on an amplifier and you change the frequencies when you get to the higher medium frequencies, it will vibrate the sand away as, as opposed to together. So you, 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 if you stick between 30 and 35 hertz, then you're definitely in the ballpark. And yeah, when you're getting above 40 uh, uh, hertz, you're compromising fatigue strength of geotextiles and soils according to um, some, some experiments. And this is just a frequency. These are just graphs that are put in <coughs> simple like equations. This graph's ba basically saying that um, your effectiveness is, is one on the graph. So 31 hertz is probably your most effectiveness. But again, you, you are looking which resonates with the machine. So you may go a few, you know, a, hertz, a few hertz above or below. Now, the principle of DTS, uh, so the, the, main, the main part of DTS is the vibration of what we call impact force, and this is made up of the frequency, how fast the uh, mass is spinning, and to the imbalance, which is the radii, or how, how much offset the mass is, so it's how fast it's spinning, so it's a pr pretty simple um, concept, really. And all, all I, uh, we do is convert the frequency into a circular frequency using that simple equation there, 2 pi frequency squared. Um, that gives us our, our circular frequency and for our impact force we take the mass and we, we times it by the radii and then tack times it by the circular frequency and that gives us our impact force in kilonewtons. So at every site we do I can very accurately um, keep a track of what, what impact force or vibration we're putting into the track and I've got a DTS register with all these details in. On top of that, I also like to keep uh, concise details of the vertical load we're putting in, the static vertical load by these pistons, um, and that can be calculated pretty easily. The, we take the mass of the DTS unit, which on you know, some machines, it's, I think the ones that we use, it's 2.6 ton, um, and then you times it by the pressure, um, the piston force, which is basically pressure times area, so you can use those equations. So I... I, I Get the piston force by pressure times area using those equations. Add that to the mass of the pist piston, and I've got my downward force in kilonewtons as well as my vibrate, um, my impact force or vibration. So that's a way of keeping track of the two main forces. And this is just to give you an idea of the amplitude. Although <clears throat> we're putting in a lot of force, we're only really vibrating the actual sleepers. If you have a look at there, it's. Um, at 30 hertz, but basically from 35 to 30 hertz, a range from 2 to 2.5 mil. You've got to bear with me. I was saying to Gary before I did stand on one of my contact lenses, so I haven't quite got the right prescription in here. So if you see me squinting every now and again, that, that's the reason why. But we're generally vibrating the track between 2 and 2.5 and mil, but we're not there. But that, it's not so much how much we're moving it, it's that impact force we're putting in, which really transfers the energy into the ballast. Um, we move on to the types of DTS. This is fixed type, um, which is, um, as you can see there, we've got a box, um, an encased box, and inside there we've got, the, there's, there's your two, there's normally two systems, one on top of each other, so you've got your two shafts there. There's the eccentric masses there, which they rotate around the shaft, which causes the vibration. On the fixed DTS, they're generally 14.26 kilograms. There is a table which will document all the different machines in a minute. Um, and the reason why it's called fixed is because it, it's exactly that. That mass is fixed and it's offset at that radius, um, which I think is um, 48.9 mil. So that 14.26 kilograms is offset at um, 48.9 mil. So it's a good system, but it's nowhere near as, as flexible as the next one. Now, th this is what it looks like. This is an animation of fixed DTS. There's your encased weight, the box that I've just showed on the previous slide. So you've got two shafts there, one there and one there. These are linked together. And inside there, you've got your, um, your mass is rotating around the shaft, which causes the vibration. So as you can see, you've got your cylinders there. There's four cylinders. There's your cardan shaft, 
and then you've got tensioning wheels that push out and you've got clamps that clamp the railing. I'm sure I've got a better slide of that coming up soon. And that, that's what that's where you get your horizontal vibration. So that is fixed DTS. Um, as I've said, the mask can't be adjusted. Unfortunately, there's no ramping facility in, it just comes on and off. And it goes through the entire range of frequencies as it builds up, so it has to get up to the right frequency. So best not to stop and start on a bridge because you will go through the frequencies that will uh, excite a structure. Um, the vertical load can only be applied in constant mode. So whatever you apply is on all four cylinders, that is. Apart from the AFM, um, automatic finishing machine, we'll have a look at that later. You can use standard mode, which I'll describe all these modes uh, coming up. Uh, so the only way of really controlling fixed type is to change the frequency from 30 to 35. So that, that's why it's a good system, but it's not very flexible or, con or controlled. The speed machine also controls it, but like I've mentioned, and we'll see, the speed doesn't make a huge amount of difference. So you've got limited flexibility. Um, it, this is intelligent variable DTS. This is the one where what we've been using in maintenance. We've got two machines um, that have got this on them. Um, as you can see, similar system there, um, good cross section there. There's your, there's your eccentric mass, which rotates around your two shafts there. Um, there there's, the, uh, there's another good cross section, so you can see where the masses are, and you can see where they rotate around. Um, but the main difference is this is a much heavier mass. This is 43.45 kilogram. So, and the other thing, you can offset it. Now, you can only offset it by 0 to 17.3 mil, which doesn't sound a lot, but when you're rotating 43.45 kilograms, every millimeter is, is quite significant. Um, now, there's a table, which unfortunately I can't really read at the moment, but I'm hoping you'll bear with us. Um, there's the frequency ranges that we're looking at. So we look at 30 or 35 hertz. We generally lose, which I'll come to around 80. So as, as you can see the different, you can see how the frequency and the offset. So this is the radii, this is the 0 to 17.3 mil. And that's just in, uh, in percentage. So obviously 50% uh, is half of 17.3 mil, yeah. So as you go, as you offset the, so you can stay on the same frequency, but as you offset the weight, you can see. Now those equations that I went through a, a few slides ago will literally give you those figures. Yeah, so that, that's just showing you that. Uh, is an animated version of variable DTS. And again, you've got um, encased um, fly weights and tooth wheels. So there's your masses in those two shafts there and there. You've got your four uh, cylinders to supply your dynamic, um, dynamic load. And again, you've got your tensioning wheels and clamps and your vibration is out. But like I said, the main difference is there is, is the weight is controllable. Now, here's a good slide. So what happens is the tensioning wheels push out and your clamps push in, so that's what grip, grips the rail. So you really want to make sure your fastenings and pads are in good condition, obviously, because if, if, if there's any play in there, you'll just lose a lot of power and, you, you know, you'll be... And if, if anyone was going to ask, it has very little impact on the fastenings and pads, the actual vibration, minimum. Um, the good thing is as well you can ramp in and out with variable DTS and there's three sorts. Um, you can have no ramp where the DTS starts immediately. That's good for doing turnouts. So you can do the main route and if you're doing a turnout leg, you can literally start from the first doing this the bank holiday weekend actually just gone. Um, so we literally started from the first plane bearer. Um, you've got to excuse me. You've got DTS ramp where the DTS will ramp in over. The uh, nominal ramp, 15 meters, you can change that um, to a desired value, but we, we generally use it at 15. And you've got um, starting delay. So this is really good because what it does, because the DTS is behind the tamping working area or the times, if uh, the operator will basically press a trigger and it will wait for the DTS system to come where to the working area was when we started tamping, then it will ramp up from there. So you don't have to mark up where the DTS starts. It does it all automatically. So generally, we will use starting delay because it's really easy. We start tamping, the DTS waits till we get to the working area and then ramps up. 
Um, like I said, full control of the impact force this time. So we've got 0 to 100%, 0 to 17.3 mil offset. Gives us massive, so for different track conditions, I, which I'll come to a bit later on. We, we, you know, I can up it or I can lower it if we're going through a few sensitive areas. Um, we don't have that rapid. Um, it doesn't drop. It literally stops straight away, so we don't slow down through the frequency. So potentially, yeah, you could stop on a structure, <laughs> and the. Intelligent DTS can be, uh, the, the vibration, sorry, can be, or impact force, uh, applied in three ways. You've got constant, automatic speed, and, and automatic lowering. Now, constant is where we you'll just pick a value. The nominal value we pick is 80%, and it will be 80%, uh, that's the offset, and it will just stay at 80% throughout the site. Um, automatic speed, then it will slow down the rate of DTS if the machine's slow. So if you've got a site with a lot of obstacles in where you're going slow or stopping, you might want to do use this. We've used it on a few turnouts. Unfortunately, the default on the machine was 2,000 meters an hour, um, which I think was a bit of a mistake because only the 093Xs can work at that rate. So I got special permission off Colas and I got a few buddies in Placer actually and went down and jumped on the machine and I actually changed this default setting and I changed it to 700 meters an hour, which was, we were normally tamping about 650. So that way, when you were starting to use automatic mode speed, it will start slowing down with the rate of wear tamping. So we're getting a couple more of these machines. So I, I have contacted Placer to try and make sure these settings are a bit more realistic. Um, but I, don't often use that. We'll generally use constant mode because it, it, it's quite even and, uh, you know, if, if we've if got a good site. And if we're doing s and I'll come to in a bit what we tend to do now. Well, stop, start, we'll do our tamping and then we just come back and do the DTSing afterwards. And finally, automatic mode lowering. So you can put a, you can put a figure into the machine that you want to set the track 5 mil, 10 mil, and the machine will literally vibrate until you get that. Um, and it'll have 5% on for each millimeter. So what you've got there are gyros, um, accel accelerometers and, and stuff like that. So what it'll do, it'll, it, it, it measures the gradients and the level of the track, and it will just check that whether you're settling it. So it will remove the power or increase the power. So it'll remove the power if you're settling it too much, it'll increase it if you're not getting your settlement. Um, it's a very, very clever system. This is it. Um, these are where the trolleys are. There's the DTS there, if you can see my mouse. And these are the trolleys that I've just showed you, which basically run the DRP system, data recording processor, which is a bit of a separate entity, but that, that measures all different parameters of the track. Um, and there it is in, in the flesh. You can see it on the machine. Now, I don't really use this. I think I asked why this was on the machine, and it was developed for obviously there's customers worldwide and some customers i think it was china that requested this but to me if you're if you i don't understand why you'd put want to put a set settlement on if all your lifts are different throughout a site so to me if we've got a 10 mil lift or we've got a 40 mil lift why do we want to settle that five we want the dts to settle it what it should be settled so it's not a mode i've used yet but i suppose it's there you know it's like i said customers um request different things don't they um now the um static load can also be applied in three different ways that was the impact forces of the static load so we've got constant we've got standard and we've got high rail variable low rail constant um it can be ramped in and ramped out as well um it has less influence in the impact force but it still makes a big difference and but it is an important factor obviously because the higher vertical load and it helps with the settlement now, constant, I can just put um, the pressure in. Like I said at the start, we, we put the pressure in in bar, and I, I can convert that into kilonewtons. So I could just put a set pressure in 50, and it will keep it on 50. Now, I don't use that mode. That mode would be good for renewal. Say if you've got to do a few passes, what you want is the first two passes on constant at a very high rate to get all your settlement, and then you want to tidy it up, tidy it up afterwards. So what we generally use in maintenance is standard both rails. So I would put a setting in, say, 50, 50, 55 bar, and this would take into account a cross level. So it was so if if we if we've got one way higher than another, it'll just apply a higher force 
I'm there just to get close. I'm only talking a few millimetres here, but it's just a good way of fitting. So we generally use that on, on tangent or straight track. Um, we've also got super elevated rail pressure variable, which basically means the low rail is constant pressure and the high rail is the float rather than the standard. Uh, so if we're on a curve, we generally want to keep the low rail standard and we keep the high rail. So they're, they're the two modes we've been using in maintenance. And this one shows you, one is the op optimum. So this is saying that 240 uh, kilonewtons is the optimum for uh, downward pressure, which equates to 60 bar when I, I run it through, my, uh, through the equation. I generally use 55 bar. Um, and working speed, now this shows you the optimum working speed is probably 1500 meters an hour. We're working about six or seven hundred really, but as you can see, we're still very close. I mean, that's one point one. Do you know what I mean? So where the the working speed has so li very little effect on there, but it is a factor, which is why I put that in. Um, yeah, just to remind you that the, these all, we will these will all affect that uh, track settlement graph. Um, it does appear a couple of times in this graph. I'll probably put it in once too often this slide, but just keep that in mind. Um, and also, we've been using. I'll come to this more later on, but this is just to plant a seed. We've been using, there is a specific DTS overlift. I mean, these machines are fantastic. It's got a conventional overlift system and it's got a differential overlift system. I'm doing a talk on overlift in July as well for the PWI at some, I uh, can't remember the date, but it will describe all these systems. But the, the one we use on DTS is specific DTS overlift. So uh, the Austrian rail federation uh, did a load of experiments using the dts and and, for, and so this graph basically said if you've got a 25 mil lift at 100 percent it's going to put about 11 mil overlift on yeah not massive overlifts but still makes that and the reason why we want to have that overlift on and i'll come to it later on is because because we are settling the track we are got we may be going below design level so we might go out and do all the surveying and design and even either the trains will set if you don't use DTS or DTS. So if we could just put that overlift on, which which is commensurate to the DTS forces, we can get closer to our... So we've been using this in, in anger, actually, and we're getting some really, really good results with it. Um, so that is part one. I've probably flew through that quite a bit and probably blown. Um, so I'll give you... No, I'm doing all right. Is that doing all right, is it? Yeah, yeah. It, it, there is quite a lot in it. So I'll just yeah, give us a few seconds and we'll go into part two. It is quite a technical subject, no DTS. Um, so part two, just to remind you, we're looking at UK DTS machines, the use of DTS, how we've been using it, suggested settings, uh, resistance to lateral displacement, um, and some of the results we're getting for questions. Now, these are the machines in the UK, all listed um, on the left-hand side. We've got the DGS62N. A dedicated DTS machine. I think we've only got one in the UK now. Pretty sure it's owned by Balfour Beatty, but I don't think it does much. I think it's gathering dust in East Anglia somewhere. Um, they're, they're again all got the fixed systems. Since 2017, the DGS 62Ns now have intelligent DTS, but the one that we've got in this country was, was here long before that. Um, we've got the 2X and 3X dynamic machines, so they're the um, high output, they're the high output tampers that high output generally use. Obviously the 2X is a two, slamper, two sleeper tamper machine, and 3X is three uh, sleepers. Again, they're the fixed system, so they've generally got 14.26 kilograms. And there it is there, there's the 48.9 mil uh, offset. Um, these are the machines that we've got in maintenance, um, now, as you see, we've got a much heavier weight and we can offset it. That, that's the big difference I was showing you. Um, it's, there's big ranges for the vertical low, but yet we're generally keeping around 50 to 60 bar. Uh, there's no, not much point in going below anywhere much below that. Cylinders are generally the same. There's the general weights of the uh, DTS systems. Um, and there, there's the working speeds. Um, these are working speeds, tamping working speeds, though, bear in mind. So if you're if you've already tamped, you can DTS as fast as you can DTS. Uh, I wouldn't recommend going above 2,000 meters an hour. I think we did a DTS. I think I, we did it about 700 meters an hour. Um, we don't want uh, that. That that seems like a good speed. Then we've got the ballast cleaning machine that has the DTS on. I'm going to show you all pictures of all these and explain them. Now these have two single DTS 
um, systems because they do it in layers, which I'll show you in a minute. And then we've got the old AFM again, which is has fixed DTS. So there's, there's a picture of the DGS 62, and that's not the one in the UK, but that was the only picture I could find of it, I'm afraid. Um, I've got, I'd like to find out where that is actually. Uh, like I said, dedicated DTS machine doesn't do much else, doesn't tamper or anything. There's um, the high output machines, that one's in particular a 3X. So you, again, you've got your three tamper machine with your DTS system on the rear. Uh, this is the 092X, so this is the ballast cleaning machine. So this one's got slightly heavier um, weight, 17.11 kilograms, and there's only a single system. And then, and the idea of this is, is you have a single system vibrates one ballast layer, then the machine will then drop ballast, and then the other um, system will then regulate the other, so you can uh, regulate, uh, stabilize the other. So you're, you're, you're stabilizing one layer, dropping some more ballast, stabilizing that layer, that's the idea of that. And then you, you will generally follow up with the TAMP and the DTS working at the same time. And we've got the AFM, which is an all singing and dancing ballast regulated with DTS on the back, basically. You've got a very high capacity hopper and um, good machines. But uh, this is the only one of the fixed type where it's got the standard in the in the static force. Do you remember the standard, which takes account of cross level? So uh, all the others are constant apart from the AFM, which has standard. Um, and there's um, the Western, my beloved machines there, a uh, picture taken at Morton Cutting, and they're the ones with intelligent DTS, these are the 09. 4x4 four 4S four, four dynamic machines and that's where the DTS is so obviously the machine well it's not obvious if you haven't worked with tampers sorry the machine on that picture is working from left to right and uh, the DTS is situated at the rear so it's after you do your tamping um, you have to you can't just go on DTS track unless you've done something to it because it's already consolidated so if the track's been tamped and lined or you've had some ballast cleaning on, or you've had a renewal, that's when you want to use DTS, because like I said, you're in that unconsolidated, uneven, weakened state. And the forces as well should be commensurate to the application, i.e. if we're just doing maintenance lifts, I can have settings which I'm pretty confident will settle maintenance lifts, say up to 25, 30, 35 mil were. Of course, if we're doing renewals, we want to put much higher settings in because we've got a lot more of the ballast bed to consolidate. So, so there's, there's, there's your ranges um, at different frequencies. So as you can see, the fixed systems are all um, 99 to 135. You've got your ballast cleaner, which is very limited, but that is followed by, like I've said, that's followed by a DTS tamping machine. And you've got the intelligent DTS. Like I said, you can put your um, imbalance right down and right up and that's why we've got such flexibility it can be the least or most powerful machine so it is very good on, on dip, for different applications like i said we can do settings for maintenance for renewals um or, or for the site conditions which i'll come to in a minute um structures like i've mentioned re they generally resonate 23 25 hertz many studies have found the vibration of dts is safe for structures like i said there's never been any um documentation of, of anything being damaged. I mean, I was talking to an apprentice um, last year and he was saying he was taught on the course that PTS can bring houses down and I'm just like, where do we get this stuff from? It's like, um, it's like, it's like something out of a soap opera, isn't it? Um, avoid ramping in and ramping out of structures though, particularly with, like I've mentioned with fixed DTS because you're going through the ranges. Um, it's, um, it, it, it's it's minimal risk, but obviously we are we are we we do avoid tunnels. Very good idea to avoid tunnels, um, viaducts as well, and cast iron structures. Uh, we generally avoid them um, because of their brittle nature of the cast iron. Yeah, it do, doesn't doesn't uh, be that well to vibration, and we use a, a TAF three two seven four. Um, I don't know if you, how well you can see it on here, you can't actually see it quite well. Yeah, so we can get all our buildings off our Opus database and our structures off cars and they're categorised to one, two and three. One, you can go ahead and DTS. Two, um, you, you consult with the structures and three is a no-go. Uh, ironically, uh, avalanche shelters are 
number three, so they can withstand standard avalanche, but we can't actually DTS him, which I thought, again, was a bit ironic. Uh, we've got a bit of work to do here, because we've got loads of culverts, which DTS doesn't even reach, and we've got overhead line structures, um, don't need to be on now. I mean, if there was a nuclear war, two things that survive it, it'd be cockroaches and series one overhead. <laughs> <laughs> I don't actually know why it's on there. Um, and this is, this is a pretty good graph saying, so, if you have a look, you know, you're talking three metres away from the track, you know, you've lost about, what, in 70% of your forces there. So you can see DTS dissipates very quickly. It doesn't travel full soil well. Um, and this, this is a really good, um, this was a study done and it shows you the acceler, you know, there was accelerations in the soil and, and stuff and around the structures and stuff like this. Now, as you can see, this, this was the ballast uh, cleaning one. So it's got the, the different DTSs, you know, it does it in your ballast layers. So they were quite weak. But I, then we came in and tamped it, and in the vertical direction, it was, you know, and then we followed up with the DTS. So as you can see in the vertical direction, the tamping was three times as great. So we're, we're, we're sending in tampers for, since the 1950s, yeah, and then we seem to have a panic attack whenever a DTS is near it. Um, just reputation, a lot of it. Um, this one is is pretty good because it shows you how the, it it shows you uh, ones on timber, ones on concrete, and it shows you how much greater some of the forces are on timber as opposed to concrete. There's there's peak and mean. Now a couple of these tables, I've got this report. A couple of these tables are the uh, wrong way round. But if you actually work out the mean and the peak are the wrong way, but what it's basically saying is is don't DTS timber because it does put a lot of um, shocking to the components, uh, so um, BTS concrete, but also ha what it does to each different. So it, hit, it hits the rails more than some of the micro switches and the POE and stuff like that. So um, I'll come to S and C in a minute, but it is a, it is it is a good slide to show that yeah the difference between concrete and timber. Um, I have to look round to the screen, I'm afraid, because I can't really see it on my computer in front of me at the moment. Um, so it, it is quite an interesting slide. Um, Earthworks and geotextiles. Um, studies have found that DTS influence of soils is very low. Like I said, it doesn't travel, does just not travel through soil very well at all. Um, avoid, like uh, mentioned it earlier on, um, medium range, 40 hertz and above. 80%, uh, like the graph shows, is gone by three meter depth. Uh, mines and mining areas should be avoided, bit of common sense, and areas of subsidence, you know, let's, let's not tempt fate. Um, again, on the study, there was, they just, just wanted to show the difference with frequency. So you can see um, on the, in the visa profile, so as you can see, this is looking from the side. And as you can see, that's at 20, um, that's at 28 hertz, and that's at 38 hertz. None of these are frequencies that we actually use, unfortunately, but when this study was done, we weren't really using DTS, but you can see the difference in just the, how much the frequency will, will, will affect the vibration. Now, this is the same from a longitudinal timber view, so we're looking down the track there, but as you can see, 28 hertz and 38 hertz there, so you can see big differences there. Is that okay, yeah? Yeah. Um, DTS on S&C had a bit of a battle with um, technical authority on this one, um, but managed to get it passed out on modern PLE, um, HPSS, high drive and inverter clamp lock systems. We could also use it on uh, conventional clamp locks, um, rail clamp point locks. I uh, provided them on concrete bearers, but not the Balfour BERT60 designs. Uh, there's three Balfour BERT60 designs, two of them incorporate elevated fastenings. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the piggyback system. And what you've got is uh, we've had trouble with um, forces and vibrations shearing off because we've got quite a long um, fastening and and it, we've had trouble with the housings being vibrated off. So we've, um, we're not allowed to do them. Uh, we've got to put higher forces in with S and C because the heavier components. Obviously, we've got you know big barriers. You could have crossovers, a lot more rails. There's a lot more to vibrate in. Um, we generally, like I said, they're stabilised crossovers after tamping. Did one on the bank holiday weekend. Just get just gone. You can use auto speed on turnouts provided you've got a clear run. If you if you constantly stopping and starting, it's best just to tamp and then just come back and you're literally. 
going through at a walking pace. So your DTS in behind the turnout is going to take an extra 20 minutes if you set the machine back. Um, obviously, a thorough check of the fastenings and talking of all the bolts uh, and screws or whatever components are on there. But then you should be, we should be doing that for S&C tamping as well. It's no different. We should, what we should be doing for S&C tamping, we just should be doing for DTS tamping. Um, and, you know, that's it. Um, I don't know if this will work. This is footage. This was Hayes and Harlington on, on Christmas Day, actually. Clicking the image. That's working. Uh, could we have it with the sound on? I'll, I'll try. Um, Gabby, please. All right, so that is DPS working. This is Christmas Day, actually. A bit of parallel DPS footage for you on a modular fair, on a modular layout. You can see the see the ballast vibrating and the stones and the picture. Yeah. So that was Christmas Day just gone. You see, um, the winter nights fly by in my house, don't they? Um, uh, this was a recent one, a double junction at Barnwood. God, so this was just the May Bank holiday just gone. So this is uh, straight off the press for you. And here's a bit more footage. This isn't very good. I didn't really. Uh, this was at the very start of the job when we were ramping in. I should have waited till, so we can't really see as much there. Um, it's not worth putting the... Sorry, that was it was just a bit. Uh, we, you can see we're just in the S&C area there. Um, but that was just to show you how it looks and sounds, just to give you an appreciation. Um, some suggested settings. So, like I said, if we're on... If we're doing relayed or re-ballasted, we go back to the mode I said before. So your vertical mode will be constant and you put it on a high rate, 70 bar, and you put 95% because you want your, you just want to put maximum settings on your first just to give it that consolidation. So your first two passes, you would, um, you would have your, uh, use constant modes and high settings. Then on your last pass, you'd want to put it down to standard so it takes a bit more care of your cross level um, and you're in that, so you just rein everything back in a bit just as a finishing. So that's why this machine gives you the flexibility. Not only can you change your power, but you can change the way you apply it. Um, same for S&C. You'd really go for it on the first couple of passes and then rein it in. You could use auto speed or you could like um, you could do the um, PTS in after the tamping, which is what we've started to do now. Um, play 90, we are, these are generally the standard settings I, I use on most jobs now. 55 bar, 80% imbalance. Probably around 31, 32 hertz, um, vertical mode, standard. If it was on a straight, like I said, if it was on a curve, I'd employ the um, low rail, uh, constant high rail variable. I hope you tell you, I am really throwing this a bit at you, like, um, but we'll, hopefully you'll take some in. Uh, yeah, and you, and you can lower it if we've got some cap B structures that we're not sure, but we really want a DTS, and we probably won't get the full benefit, but any benefit's better, any settlement is better than leaving it for trains in my book. So like I said, we can lower the pressure or we can we can reduce the imbalance, of it. so we can reduce the vibration and the, um, and the static load. Um, resistance to lateral displacement. Um, I was going to say we've all seen that, but given by a few phases in there, I don't think some, some people have. Um, it, uh, resistance to lateral displacement is how we measure how strong the track is, and it's the force required to move a sleeper by two millimetres. Um, there were two types that were unloaded and loaded, and lo loaded uh, means that the sleepers are fastened down, and loaded uh, that means that, uh, they're unfastened. And there's a few types here, which I'll go through 07, single sleeper method. So the 07 method, it's called the 07 because it used an 07 machine, and it was just measuring the force after tamping and after DTSing to, to push these sleepers. So as you can see, you've got your, before tamping, you've got your 160%. Now that would what we'd like if we just tamped it, but after DTSing, we're, we're getting, getting a lot of that back. We're getting just over 50% of that back according to those experiments. Um, this is an unloaded method. And, and obviously these, these forces are a lot lower because the sleepers are unfastened, so they're going to be a lot easier to move. But I, and again, after stabilising, this one wasn't quite up to 50%, but it still made a big difference. Um, now, going back to this, in case you missed it the first two times, we've got the settlement graph. Now, what um, Bernard Lichberger's book um, had it, this huge equation, and I, could, I substituted this equation for actually the DTS settings. So I can then 
predict using the different settings what the track settlement will be. So I can take that traditional formula and take it one step further. And according to experiments, the lateral displacement increases the more we settle the track. So if I can settle the track, say 10 mil, I'll get 34% back 15. That, that's according to that. Not really to in and, in and out of that, but that is just another method in case. Um, and you've also got the machine. Our tampers measure it behind it. Our DRP system has um, something called a dynamic measurement. If we reset it, it and it, it's very good. It takes into account like the working speed, the frequency, but if you have a look at the hydraulic motor pressure, even it takes into account absolutely everything. And for us, we, we get this one recorded, the average over five meters. So basically over five meters, how much to move a sleeper two mil. And it put, this is a DRP printout. Now the very top one, is QVW, which is the German word for RLD, resistance to lateral displacement. So if you look at that graph, we're, we're looking around, after we're DTSing, we're getting really strong track back. We're looking at around well over 300 kilonewtons, probably about 330 kilonewtons, and that is at, directly after tamping. So that shows you the strength that DTS is putting back into the, um, into the track, which is why we can add that five degree CRT of open up at higher line speeds. Um, uh, there it is again. Uh, we, we did a bit of stop starting on this site, so you can see the difference with stop starting and carry, and as opposed to uh, constant moving. Um, and I did promise you a look at longevity on uh, track quality. Now we had this. This was a real problem. Multiple wet bed site um, had a TSR on it. weren't a pretty site at all. And as you can see, uh, satisfactory straight to very poor on the next measuring one. The lads will come and do it. Sorry, the staff will come and do an intervention. It'll go to poor. Um, I don't know if I can see my mouse on that. It's disappeared again. Oh, there it is. And it'll go to poor. Then next measuring one in a month, back to super red. So you can see you're losing this site really quickly. So we come in and did a DTS tamp. Um, I hope you can guess where the DTS tamp is. I don't need to point that out. And not only was the tamp massively successful, we go from an, an SD 6.11 to 1.71. We then did a follow-up tamp two months later, and then you have a look, considering we're going from poor to super red, I mean, 18 months later, we were still in satisfactory, which is just phenomenal. I wasn't, we weren't expecting, I mean, we were finding this on a lot of sites, but as you can see on there, if you have a look, that uh, I really laid it on there, 65 bar, put a lot of pressure and li literally maximum impact force so i give it everything i made sure you know we did a fuller check of the site and we give it everything but you can see the difference dts has made for longevity on that site this is a site this is i put this one in because it's a high cut this is 150 mil count on max 110 mil count deficiency curve and we'd had a pole that had been in there for a while so you, you generally get a bit of ballast memory if you if you leave them too long you can you will tap them out but because the Ballast is because you've had a fault in there that long. The ballast is used to being settled in that in that way, so it's so it'll generally deteriorate quite quickly. We call that ballast memory. But as you can see, after we DTS'd it, still in the good. Um, well, still in the good. Eighteen months later, just incredible, right? Um, S and C. Um, so we got the um, S and C from Saturday. It was good S and C anyway, tactically to be fair. But we we've, we've kept it in the good again. Um, so we, 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 uh, we can put out the intervention so you can see some of the results are really, um, and I thought that this graph was, was, was really, really good because it shows you the deterioration rates there. So deteriorates, we intervene with a tamp there. Deteriorates, we intervene with a DTS tamp. And as you, oh, sorry, I pressed the mouse button. As you can see there, as soon as we DTS, we've got the deterioration. Flattens off incredibly. So I thought these graphs are really good at showing how DTS really give that, that consolidated ballast really really gives us some uh, longevity as well as what i was talking about the resistance to lateral this, this strength so not only can we tamp in hot hotter weather and um, gives us more flexibility around the summer raise speeds we've got this massive bonus of longevity um not long left now don't worry uh, we're in the final straight this is going back to what i said before there is a cross level settlement compensator i'll talk about that more when I do the talk on overlift, but this is the DTS overlift, like we can set it on a percentage, and there's that graph again. So we can take that graph 
into that settlement equation. So I, we can do a design lift and we can um, calculate the DTS overlift and then we can calculate the settlement after using DTS. So it's very good for getting near design position and particularly through structure. So we tried out um, the platform at Marsh Barton because we were having trouble with hand. And yeah, we got m much, much closer to the as built position. Now, we just started really using overlifts. Now, those results I showed you were before we started using overlift. So now we've actually started using it. Um, you can see the massive improvements we made, but I'm going to need a bit more time for longevity. So we were getting really good longevity before, but now with overlift, I'm pretty sure we're going to get even. So we, we, we generally use DTS overlift. And it's really good under overhead line because if we're lifting 25 mil, we know and we're calculating, we're settling at 10 mil on the DTS only. So I can, um, put, I don't know if you should be saying this, we're doing overlift on the overhead line, and technically we're lifting the tracks, you know, 30, 35 mil, but the DTS is coming around and settling it well, because well below our mandated 25 mil. So we're getting our 25 mil there and then, and it's holding. So the overlift on DTS is just, um, it's like DTS on steroids in a way. So we're going to keep track of a few of these sites and, and just see the duration rates. But um, yeah, so hopefully some of you will be glad to know that is the end. And I hope that was um, interesting and you took some out of it. And if anyone's got any questions. Oh, thanks, Graham. You're bang on time. Is yeah, that <laughs> I was keeping my eye on that all the way through. Yeah. Um, well, I've got, I'll, I'll start the questions. And then, um, Christian, if you can keep an eye on the questions on the, online. Um, I mean, it, it's sounds like an amazing system but you mentioned at the start that we don't or haven't been using it as much as why is that you know it's, it's yeah, clearly I've, got obvious benefits yeah i mean we've intelligent dts is quite new actually to be fair so we've only had the machines two years so we haven't had that flexibility before yeah. um it was a bit of a dying art so the skills of using it left the industry almost um i've got a Diplomatic, we've gone quite risk averse these days, haven't we? Because and there are reasons for that, because you know health and safety, and so we are very conservative in the way we write standards. So without going into two D, I had a we had a big battle, Western mm. and, and technical authority, um, and I we, we sort of like devolved as a route and did our own um, standard that that we wrote. But we also have to now comply with the. Um, I know the new st this standard is really good. Actually, it's a massive improvement on the old one. But we can be just a bit. Um, it can be a bit conservative. But the main reason is, yeah, it's like I said, the skills left. The new machines have come in, and there isn't even though. I mean, I'm quite fortunate here because I used Curve Laser quite a few years back and got to know someone from Placer and he was the bloke that actually commissioned most of the so a lot of this stuff about DTS overlift and cross over and the controls he, I, he, he taught me a lot of it he didn't tell me what settings to use he just showed me what so then I had to go out whereas so I, he retired from Placer and, and moved about 50 minutes from where I live I'm a quite, so I was quite fortunate to be able to call on his information. So, but we are going around to other routes trying to spread it out. But it's almost like fixed DTS. We were using it, and then we've, and then this has been a bit of a void, and it's just coming back in slowly. But we've never had this flexibility before, and it's such a shame because you could see some of the results there. Uh, it, the only thing it does, though, because it really settles the ballast, it absolutely chews up the ballast. So you've got to make sure you, you you use more ballast on a DTS site than you would on a conventional tamping. But that's because you're really compact. Doing this job. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But if you can get a good uh, fully ballasted site and DTS it, uh, tamp it well. You know, your tamping is important at the right depths, pressures, all the other stuff about tamping. So if you're disciplined in your tamping, you use DTS, and that, yeah, that's some of the results we're getting. Yeah. Questions from the room. Uh, yeah, I just like to see this. Well, you know, we, I'm an electrification engineer, so for the new electrification in the world, we just would have been asked to buy RAM 75 TM and plus 25 yeah. meters, 100 millimeters. Yeah. So based on your tamping, whatever, so what, are the, what is the magnitude of likely to go up? Realistically, I mean, yeah, I mean, 100 millimeters we have been asked to consider, which is quite a lot. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And the context of that is that drives cost into electrification because yeah, no, that means yeah. more bridges have to be rebuilt or track lowered or. Yes, because so remember we are doing a lot of track levels, reconstruction. Yeah. So 100 millimeters is quite a lot for us. We are, we are 
talking about 20, 10, 10, 20 million meters for a clear input. So what realistically like you to go up? Yeah, I mean, period of time actually. Yeah, I mean that, that that's a that's a really really good question because I, it it will put see seventy five millimeters. Some people think that's three times to twenty five, and and you just like that. So yeah, yeah, and I tell you what, seventy five millimeters is probably thirty or forty years. Because because yes. what see, yeah. write this down <laughs> <laughs> and sign it at the end. That's my question. Right. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, you did. If you're using DTS and we're and we've got a dis, and we've got a very a tamping strategy, 75 millimeters is fine. I'd be I would snap people's because obviously we've got 75 is fine. Um, we obviously got our type structures. We're going to get that everywhere. We've got a couple of Stevenson and quite a few down here. Um, but for that reason, is it's it's all about settlement. Like I said, you come and tamp it. If, if the track if the track stayed where it was, you wouldn't need to come and tamp it. It's interesting. It? See what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, historic the thing is historically, go back forty years to when I well, yeah. forty years, thirty years to when I was started on the road. Um the allowance is twenty five millimetres. Yeah, track engineer. Problem is we get asked, why is your electrification costing more than it did thirty years ago? And there's lots of answers to that, and this isn't by any means the dominant answer, but it is one of the many, many factors driven this cost increase is this yeah. additional allowance and we get we, we get told all the time that track can only ever go up track yeah. will never it well that's right down. it'll only ever go up well mm -hmm. generally yeah but, you may get wet bed but your point is what what rate it goes up over time yeah we be, we get that three times all the time don't we 25 yeah, that, so it, i probably should have warned you you yeah. walked into my trap yeah, I've got a room full of overhead lining. I know, I, yeah, I know, I'm aware now, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah. You, you've just got to be careful with what you said, though, as well. The 25 is for a single intervention. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? So the 25 mil is now what we do in that situation is we've obviously got our stanchion 60 metres apart, 62, whatever they are, and, and we've got our mid spans, so we know what they are there, but we will go to the overhead line engineer, say, at Swindon, and what we're doing is when we're the high points, we're not lifting, we're only lifting the low points because that's where the faults are. So we, we can get away with 50 or 60 mil with permission then because not because we're compromising the claim, we're lifting the track back to where it was. See yeah. what I mean? That's yeah. key. And all, yeah. If you're doing that, that's great. But that doesn't then mean that we need that 100 mil, yeah, 100 75 mil allowance. 75 is, is like the 25, like I said, is and it's just your single allowance. But 75, in my experience, if, if you said to me that we've got 75 mil all the way along here, I'm thinking, we have 35 years. Because we, we did the design for the yeah. you see out here, and, and we, that was, they were just, it was 100 mil total allowance, wasn't it? Yeah, 100 mil. So that, that's continuous. So basically what we said is the whole, the whole railway can rise by 100 millimetres over the life of the system. I mean, that, that, you, that adds costs for us. 45 years. I mean, I mean, I won't, we won't quote you, Graham. You, you stay, what, you know, what's said in the room stays in the room, but it's really interesting oh, to hear. I guess. Oh, don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's only a couple of people. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, we just need, I think we need a more integrated discussion about people don't understand track settlement. Cost and risk. Yeah. That's why I was yeah. quite detailed on track settlement. I, I purposely put that in because I've heard that quote. Well, what we will do is we will we start, start at 25 and we'll start it, or when we're in our IDCs, yeah, we'll start talking about DTS and saying, well, you know, surely even without DTS, the track, though, the, the, the track will settle. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the problem is without DTS, it's all that one even. Yeah. So you're getting ballast break. It's this right anyway. So if you're using DTS, it won't settle as much, but you won't have to intervene as well. Now, obviously, you've, you've got all your different sites. You've got your poor ground, firm ground, wet beds, embankments, cuttings, where. So, obviously, all your different tracks got to tear it at different rates. Uh, and it's the way we tamp it, whether we design it, whether we ALC it, whether it's smoothed. But, yeah, I mean, that, that's a brilliant question because that is one of the reasons why um, I've had lots of discussions about it and people cannot get in. The, people just don't understand the concept of settlement and they also don't understand how settlement damages ballast as well. Yeah, so, yeah, it's really, yeah. I, yeah. Um, That's what we have been challenging from our side. I don't think so it's likely to go under. I think 75 is more yeah. than adequate. That's my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Said 30, 40 years. yeah, yeah. Some, some bridges, they are slightly compromising. You get ramp. I mean, today, just like you go, yeah. you get that. Yeah, the first thing, absolutely no. Yeah. yeah. Uh, right. We've got some questions on the online. So, Christian, do you want to? Yeah, so we've got one from Eamon Johnston. 
Okay, yeah, yeah. do you want to read that? Yeah, yeah, it says, uh, thank you for the presentation. I think you mentioned a F3274, uh, a UTU investigation request form on the Network Rail Standards page. All I know of is the test 3302 identification of structures for DTS approval and 3303 review of assets for DTS approval as part of the 018 standard. Do you know where the test 3274 has come from? Yeah, it's a good question because what happened was that's exactly what I found. So when they put in the 3274, I put it in and I said that's a UTU test form. So they. Uh, um, so that obviously, would, that presentation is quite old. Now they were going to change the other test they told me, but that hasn't happened because that's exactly what I found. So I'm glad that's been mentioned as well. But um, I'll, I'll, I've, I've, I mean, I've got it. I've got them here. So what I'll do is, is if I'll, I'll if we can get the details, I'll, I'll send you the, the test that I've got. Send it on to me. Yeah, there's, there, there was there's been a duplication of tests. Yeah, but it's something that I spotted because because when I read that, I put it in and I fed back that's a UTU testing form. Um, so there was a duplication of tests. But what we were told is they were going to change the other form, but the, that hasn't happened. So duly noted, and I'll I'll come back on that. Yeah, yeah that's great. Yeah, we'll circulate. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, we've got from Mark Smith, uh, would you ever DTS steel sleepers? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, really good question. You've got to be a bit careful because there's different types of steel. Now, I don't know if, you, if people are familiar with steel. You've got the HH, the American track and tie systems ones. Now, some of our steel are, are hooked in, uh, which are the Americans, which are HH10, Mark 1 and Mark 2, and HH12. But all the other ones are welded on shoulders. Now, the welded on shoulders are fine. The hooking ones are almost certainly fine, but I would like to do some experiments. On, and you, you can see straight away by looking at them. So the, this HH and our ones are like this W402, W500, W560, W568 and W300 and 300H. And in between the 560s and the 300 is just the thickness. One's a 25 mil axle ton and one's a 30 um, that's 30, 25 to an axle uh, sleeper, that's all. But uh, to answer the question is yes, but um, just I just want to check the hooking ones. I've been assured because I've contacted them and they said they're fine, but I just like to do some DTSing on them. But the vast majority of steel, are, I'd say about 70%, 80% are the welded in shoulders. So yeah, yeah, we, we have DTS steel track, yeah, steel sleeper track. Uh, Take one more and then we'll yeah, there's, uh, one more we've got um one from Zaydler, uh, Michael Zaydler. Uh, oh, thank you. I know Michael, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for the presentation. Uh, please go on tour around the routes to promote BTS usage yeah. and its benefits. I, to be honest, we we have done it on a few other routes. We've done it. We've done it on So they have on, DTS machines. They, they've got yeah, they the L N E got the machines before us I was yeah I was a bit jet I had green eyes for a couple of years like but we have been where Michael works actually I am Michael anyway um we have been up to Doncaster and East Mids and they are hopefully gonna I think they've done one shift um but they are gonna start using it but yeah we are trying to get it out there definitely yeah thank you okay. All right. thanks thanks Dre. right um Right, well, um, I mean, always coming into talks, especially those of us who aren't track engineers, you're always thinking, how much am I going to learn from these, from a, from a, you know, something from the track side? But as always, it's about the interfaces, and we've already seen that, you know, track position interfaces with everything else, mm. overhead line, platform, structures, you name it. The track position is critically important to the whole railway system, not just keeping the trains on the track. So, um, yeah, really, really, really good talk. Thank you for that, Graham. Um, and I think we've all learned quite a lot. So, uh, thank you. So, um, could we just uh, thank Graham in the in a normal fashion, please? Okay. So, um, yeah, reminder: four weeks today, we'll be here again.